Okay, good afternoon. <laughs> I'll be presenting on the uh, Dominion Observatory. Uh, after the Dominion 15-inch telescope was removed from the observatory in 1974, there was a question as to whether this architecture should still stand if it no longer served its original purpose. For keeping time, seismology, and astronomy for the country. Following this inquiry, astronomers joined fellow Canadian citizens to challenge this declaration by claiming that the architecture alone was of national heritage. This presentation examines the documents, actions, and pleas to the Canadian government towards conserving Canada's national observatory, while additionally comparing this past challenge to a similar one facing it today as construction of a new super hospital campus is placed on its grounds. The Dominion Observatory is a red sandstone architectural gem. It was David Ewart's first creative opportunity as Canada's chief Dominion architect. Built between 1897 and 1902 within Ottawa's Central Experimental Farm, it was initiated upon the request of astronomer William Frederick King. With the support of Prime Minister Sir Wilfrid Laurier's Liberal government, the main objective was to place Canada's scientific astronomy program in line with international standards and to provide a measure of official timekeeping for the country. In a 2017 book titled Exploring the Capital, An Architectural Guide to the Region, by Canadian authors Andrew Waldron, Peter Kaufman, and Harold Kalman, a recent catalog entry and full page image of the Dominion Observatory can be found. Reconfirming a precedent that this building is still historically important today than it ever was before, regardless of there being no astronomical program and telescopes contained within its walls. It also summarizes why the observatory was built there, because in 1900 the Central Experimental Farm was far from city lights. It additionally allowed Canada to showcase a 15-inch refracting telescope, which was one of the largest in Canada at that time with a precision timer to track the sky to conduct the science of the stars and planets. The telescope was purchased in 1897-98 and was integral to the design of the observatory because it was purchased before they even started building the observatory. The 30-foot dome was specifically built to suit the equipment. In addition to accommodating the functions of both the astronomy and seismology program activities, The design of the observatory was based on Royal, the Royal Observatory in Greenwich, England. However, its later Romanesque revival design that was still an architectural trend in Canada in the late 1890s was still used as, as a trend that Ewart wanted to use as a complement prior to European style of buildings. Yet at the same time, he wanted it to differ in taste. Ewart was originally from Scotland and would have been familiar with European Romanesque architecture such as the Lincoln Cathedral in Britain. Tall arched windows and doorways with ornate details existed in these ancient architectural buildings. Whereas the Romanesque revival in Canada as seen with Toronto City Hall built in 1890 and Ontario Hall built in 1902 had a more, uh, less detailed design. Ewart's design of the Dominion Archives and the Victoria Memorial Museum for the new capital of Canada was also a mix of these old Euro or new American architectural designs, an ongoing character trait he gave many of his Canadian buildings. These amalgamated revival styles of architecture allowed Canada to express a new independence in identity, distancing itself from colonialism under Britain, while also utilizing the visual language of styles borrowed from old established architecture that exuded importance. 
Importance is what Canada's first national observatory wanted to express. In order to achieve a sense of equality to the rest of the world in its scientific pursuits, such as astronomy. Part of this new ideal of Canadian nationalism within the observatory was also influenced by Sir Sanford Fleming's advocacy of standard time. After his move from Scotland to Canada in 1845 to work as an engineer with the Canada Intercolonial Railway, timekeeping in Canada was later satisfied by the observatory with its synchronization not only for train travel but for the Canadian government and for fundamental Canadian institutions across the country. As seen in the ground plan of the observatory, the time service is given its own room. As the astronomy program was crucial for keeping the, the country on time, in 1917 the important use of astronomy on a national level also meant the addition of an elevator which was installed by Chief Astronomer Otto Klotz, who became the successor of William King. Although other than the elevator, the building is exactly the same in structure today in 2019 as it was when it was built in 1902. A plaque sitting to the right side of the front entrance doors installed in 1974 notes the influence of Sir Sanford Fleming in reference to time and technologies that brought forth Canada into nationhood. Beside the plaque is another one honoring the first chief astronomer of the observatory, William Frederick King. King was instrumental in requesting that the Canadian government build the new Dominion Observatory where it stands today in order to place Canadian astronomy on an international level. By doing so, he not only strengthened Canada's astronomy program, but as can be seen with his successor, successor Otto Klotz, the second chief astronomer, he also began a geodetic program for sur surveying land, which eventually would determine the boundaries between Canada and the USA, as well as boundaries between provinces, such as those determined for Saskatchewan and Alberta. Although the observatory was located on the central experimental farm, far away from light pollution at the turn of the 20th century, its unique style and construction is because it was also meant to be in harmony with the Parliament buildings. The original site for the observatory that King had worked in was located on the cliff beside Parliament. So when it moved further west to the outskirts of the city to an elevated area with little disturbance from light, the idea of grandeur for those seated at government still followed. This is evident in the image of the plowed field juxtaposed with what would normally be a style of building in a more city center setting. By 1911, the Dominion Observatory became a nurturing hub for sharing ideas about astronomy. This was another one of Frederick King's original intentions, to develop a class of men of special training and knowledge who will be useful to the country through pursuits of the applied science of astronomy and also a sister program of seismology which, which coexisted in the same building. In an image here, a delegates meeting of the Astronomical and Astrophysical Society of America can be seen, at which gathering of astronomical figures of that time began the campaign for the 72-inch telescope. This larger telescope with the update of technology at that time would eventually be housed in a sister observatory in Victoria, BC, called the Dominion Astrophysical Observatory to be led by Chief Astronomer J.S. Plaskett. However, the smaller 15-inch Dominion telescope that was still, still in the heart of the National Dominion Observatory in Ottawa would still play a major role in discoveries and mentorship with a succession of chief astronomers that would continue to garner attention from the world. For example, other buildings were constructed by David Ayrett which would create what we know today as the observatory campus. 
These complementary buildings to the main observatory were known to be an imperative extension of research conducted at the site. A topic that I will touch on in more detail later in this presentation. Another key historic event for the observatory was in 1938, when it was recognized in journalism not just nationwide, but worldwide, for the discovery of what was called Planet X. The subject is still discussed online today. For example, posts were placed on a platform called Lost Ottawa in May of 2017, indicating that this discovery piqued the interest of many as to the work being conducted in the Dominion Observatory, which became a curious investigation known in astronomy circles as the Ottawa Object. The other noted achievement for the observatory is its past employment for one of the first women astronomers in Canada within a level of national astronomy. Miriam Berland, a graduate from McGill University in 1926, was hired in 1928 by the director, Meldrum Stewart. An image of Berland can be seen here with her standing beside Ruth Northcott, second row left center, and then director Stewart is near front center. With the observatory's discoveries entering journalism, it also began to be seen as a monumental national local for science research, as seen here in an NFB film made in 1938 called The Capital City. There is also evidence that Astronomy circles such as RASC were involved with meetings and other events within the National Observatory, lending an element of public outreach on behalf of the astronomy program within Earth Sciences. Here we can see a couple of letters written by Meldrum Stewart in 1946, informing astronomer Miriam Berland of the Ottawa Centre RASC visit and group tours that would span through time service, solar physics, seismology, and of course the dome where the workings of Canadian astronomy on a national level would be discussed. The public outreach for the Dominion Observatory was not only important for supporting its reason for being, it also promoted a much needed continuation of interest in Canadian astronomy once again. In addition to seismology which equally used the observatory as a hub to discuss earth physics, on a national and international level. This can be seen in a 1951 pamphlet advertising the meeting for the Eastern Section Seismological Society of Canada. A couple years later, in 1954, a book called Ottawa, Portrait of a Capital, was written by Blodwin Davies, in which she dedicated a whole chapter to the Dominion Observatory, which would have been celebrating its 50th anniversary at that time. This recognition of the building as a mainstay for Canada would then be celebrated with attention again in Niagara Falls region for Canada's centennial celebrations. Canadia, a model village of what was deemed to be the most impressive pieces of architecture in Canada, was created in the late 1960s to showcase Canada's institutional achievements to date. Here, the main advertising section of the pamphlet, which summarizes what can be seen at the celebratory site in Niagara Falls, Ontario, includes the Dominion Observatory in the top center left image. A young girl visiting peers over it like a human monster to give the reader a sense of imaginative scale. An inner map of the park site gives greater detail of how the model buildings are placed and not so much a chronological order, but in an order of value to Canadian historical memory and conscience of nationhood. Each positioning asks who we were at 100 years of Canadian history, while being explained in a visual architectural 3D diagram for one to walk through and even touch. As seen here in the top right corner, the Parliament buildings are listed as number one. This is expected because of the course, the seat, uh, because of course the seat of government is a major achievement for running the entire country. What is exhibited next is an arm of parliament, building number two, 
that of the Dominion Observatory, which acts as an example of how important astronomy was thought of in connection to the building, even though the pro program would close in 1970, two years following this display. At the time of the astronomy program closure in 1970, the observatory chief astronomer was Mary Gray, the second woman to work at a national level of astronomy in succession to Miriam Berland. Gray would be the first voice of concern about the, about the protection of the Dominion Observatory and the related telescopes, the tool of trade, that would be regarded as no longer relevant without astronomy being conducted. This is when she began to look at ways in which the history of the building on its own merit could safe, be safeguarded as ideas floated around for its reuse in a different manner or a recycling of the landscape altogether. While decisions were being made as to what to do next, Gray continued to educate young students in astronomy and the public via group tours and related projects in regard to the telescopes that could still be utilized for educational viewing, but no longer for governmental use due to the encroaching light pollution of the growing city. However, by 1973-74, these tours were ceased as new fire code rules were pressed on heritage buildings that did not have secondary access to fire exits. In fact, during the 1970s, many of these heritage buildings had tough choices. They either had to renovate or close down. Also in 1974, the Dominion Observatory was facing an even greater risk as developers began to regard the Central Experimental Farm Heritage Site as prime land to build upon. Many news articles in the mid to late 1970s document this land war between safeguarding it for the continued use of the people of Canada or succumbing to what developers called progress of the growing city to clear old buildings on the site for the new use of recreational facilities for expansion of housing, apartment towers, or even the nearby civic hospital expansion. This pressure was being felt at the Dominion Observatory campus in particular, as the main road behind it called Carling Avenue was expanded to two lanes and then into four lanes for each side, requiring the demolishment of the North Azimuth building that you had built as a pair in 1912 for the Canadian Prime Meridian. What is a North American equivalent to that of the Greenwich, England European Meridian? Rask Ottawa branch, which Mary Gray and Miriam Berlin were past members of, also began to voice concern of Canada's representation in astronomy being lost. One Ottawa Rask member in particular, our Arthur Covington, who some of you may know as Kenna's first radio astronomer, sat on the Heritage Committee within its society. He took other members' concerns for the Dominion Observatory seriously by channeling it to further levels of government on behalf of Rask National and the Canadian Society of Astronomy. He saw the destruction of the North Dominion Observatory azimuth as did Mary Gray as an alarm bell, that the National Observatory and its related buildings were at further risk and likely possible to end up in a similar demise if no action was taken. His efforts are seen highlighted here in his documented correspondence to Heritage Ottawa, the National Trust of Canada, Director of National Resources Canada, and even Prime Minister Pierre Trudeau at that time in which he expressed national heritage concerns and facts on behalf of RASC membership to the Canadian government, and on behalf of all of those interested in promoting and safeguarding the history of Canadian science. He pleaded for a legal protection order to be placed on the observatory and its entire campus. Furthering his mission was Covington's firm belief that the architecture should be designated not just as a national importance to Canada, but of national scientific heritage designation too. In his attempts to achieve this, he placed an application to Indian Northern Affairs, Canadian Engineering Heritage Record, in August of 1974. This was in addition to his educational presentations on the subject, 
reported to Rask during meetings in which he announced the installation of the new historic plaques that were placed at the front of the observatory mentioned earlier in this presentation. Covington also felt it was imperative to keep the telescopic instruments within observatory buildings. However, his other RAS colleague, Mary Gray, had another take on this, which to this day has been a source of argument. Covington was successful in placing honorary heritage designations on the observatory buildings through Parks Canada Heritage, seen in the numeral signage that is placed on the buildings now. This was a win for the beginning of the protection of the site. Yet, in October, the fall of 1974, Gray's idea of transferring all of the telescopes of the observatory to the Canadian Museum of Science and Technology occurred. As Gray believed that even though the telescopes were integral for the heritage of the observatory, which Covington continued to voice, she also wanted to balance public outreach by having a way of utilizing the telescopes again. For if there is no education, how would one entice youth to become interested in Canadian astronomy? Which would then refer back to the observatory building from a museum setting. In order to, to do this, the telescope was placed in a specifically made new observatory on the museum grounds in which the fire code issue that was preventing public access to the scope at the Dominion Observatory could then be circumvented without affecting the architecture. Gray would also follow the telescope equipment as a new curator of astronomy at the museum. The new observatory was opened in January of 1975 at the front of the Canadian Science and Technology Museum grounds and was finally named in honor of Helen Sawyer Hogg in 1989. With the removal of the astronomy program telescopic equipment and an exit of related staff such as Mary Gray to the museum and Miriam Berlin's prior retirement, this left the seismology and geophysics program as a sole inhabitant of the observatory. Those feeling that the observatory remained vulnerable to developers began to influence authors such as Malcolm Thompson, who published a book in 1978 called The Beginning of the Long Dash a history of the timekeeping in Canada in order to place down in writing an important history of what the National Observatory should be remembered for. Articles by Richard Jarrell also began appearing in scientific journals as an avenue to educate the public on their National Observatory and for safeguarding it. However, most may agree that the two-volume literature that was written by Dr. John Hodgson in the 1980s called Heavens Above and the Earth Below, while he was director of the Dominion Observatory, and also later director of Earth's physics branch as a whole, really detailed the history of the architecture and the astronomy and the social and, uh, and the staff within its walls. Further heritage data could also be found on architecture throughout the 1990s by Parks Canada, listing the Dominion Observatory and in some listings by Stephen J. Dick that recentered the Dominion Observatory's history as being that of national importance. Regardless, we are now faced again with more challenges. During 2008, directives were given to amalgamate the archives within the Earth Sciences Libraries of Canada, the oldest and the largest for science libraries. Located down the road from the observatory in which materials have now been lost, as they prepare to succumb to developers who will be taking over the landscape on Booth Street. The implosion of Building 601 and 615 libraries of the Geological Survey of Canada is coming. Unfortunately, the Dominion Observatory Library had been transferred to that location. And who knows what has been sacrificed for the move? Because there is knowledge that all of the material could not be transferred to its new smaller location. Here we see signage that looked, that looked as it did when the city of Ottawa placed it out for proposal that the land surrounding the Dominion Observatory be changed from a national historic site as part of the Central Experimental Farm to that of industrial. 
in 2017-18. The image to my left is a present view of the landscape in front of the observatory campus as of this past late May which is being proposed as a space for the hospital parking arcades. The original plan is to have the parking above ground up to four or five stories in height, which will block the entire view of the observatory. However, the community and special organizations voiced a change in this plan for the parking to be placed underground. The concern presently for the Ottawa RASC Subheritage Committee that has just been joined is that the Dominion Observatory, in all likelihood, the land directly in front of it, may be re-proposed as above ground parking. Due to the possibility of the cost running high for the construction of the new hospital, as the main part of the site where the Sir John Carling building was imploded in 2014, left behind a burial of asbestos debris. The cleanup cost of what will affect the budget for the new hospital, may rise their budget too high. And this is when plans may be altered and, a, and an above ground parking structure may be seen as less expensive than an underground one. Here's what the hospital grounds on the CEF that have just been transferred look like. This is what the hospital's first plan looks like. It is going to be between 12 to 22 stories high. It is an example of the proposed buildings that may also include a new shopping mall. Again, another detailed view where you can see the observatory in the top corner. This is also a signage that outlines the observatory map. We are now in a phase where there is going to be a road and traffic study being conducted. And already the south azimuth is getting in the way of the road widening plans. Natural Resources Canada has also tried to strengthen the observatory campus by revitalizing the sundial and renovating the observatory house. These major renovations have included an entire back end to the home. And unfortunately, although they were trying to strengthen it, they have gutted the entire interior. Another building that is in risk is the carriage house or data center, originally built with the observatory that held all the information. It too is at risk because it is close to Carling Avenue and the new hospital site. The Science and Technology Museum also renovated and reopened in 2018. However, it no longer has the Helen Sawyer Hogg Observatory. The Dominion Telescope seen here has been placed in storage since 2017. Instead, inside the museum is the Dominion Telescope, the Astrograph from 1912 placed on display. Here's another detailed shot showing the small window door and its workings. In conclusion, we must ask who cares about our Canadian scientific related architecture. These questions have been written about in the past year in the Ottawa Citizen columns. Those who say that, that buildings have a specific function locked in a located time and when those functions cease, so does the value of the building, are wrong. Because it's exactly what other countries value to safeguard. A main example lies with the Greenwich Observatory that our observatory was designed upon. Now no longer running an astronomy program like the Dominion Observatory due to light pollution, it has a renewed value and purpose as a museum for British education, tourism, and interest in astronomy. Why can't we do the same? Our Canadian culture should remain seen as an international scale. This includes our astronomy program. If generations of population are lost in the future, either due to natural life succession or other means such as wars, it has been seen before that somehow life keeps rolling on. But if you destroy the achievements of past, past knowledge 
and in a sense a collective country's achievements, our history, than it is like they had never existed before. This is why it is important to continue voicing our concern for the Dominion Observatory as a visual reminder of how Canada began its astronomical presence on a world stage. In order to mentor our future generations to continue this pursuit in Canadian science, which includes astronomy. Thank you. We have time for a few questions while we set up for the next talk. Uh, microphone is there, I guess. Any questions for Sharon? Yeah, thank you. That was a great presentation. Just a question. If, if the other museum is no longer displaying the 15-inch uh, refractor, has there, have they looked at possibly moving it back to the original site to strengthen the, the heritage value of the building? Thanks. The Ottawa RASC has looked at that, but uh, it's very political. The museum now sees it as a key piece, and they don't, they're afraid that if they place it back in the Dominion Observatory, um, that they won't get the attention or the public to come to their uh, museum. Although it is in storage, they still want to hold on to that. But they are a bit open to, to discussing, and that's something that we're working on right now. And uh, Rudolf and Dorner, um, new, the Rudolf Dorner Museum that's going to be set up with that be able to house that telescope, or is the telescope too big <coughs> to fit in that space? I'm not sure if it can fit in that space, but I do know before that's even considered that the uh, Science and Technology Museum uh, is really, really wants to keep it in their collection. It's very difficult to convince something of that importance to be deaccessioned for another um, uh, a institution or museum when they would prefer it to be there and that's what we're facing right now along with the the, the political um, ramifications if that's all thank you thanks very much